Welcome to the world headquarters of the Mass Preacher, broadcasting from somewhere partially on ground on this continent. I entitled my teaching tonight, Itching Ears, Ephesians 4.14, 2 Timothy 4.3, 2 Chronicles 7.14. What I'm going to do is discuss these verses, and I'm going to separate them, and then I'm going to conclude with another portion of Scripture, and I'm hoping to be put like a string through, I'm um, put beads together, and then you could get a picture of all these different things and how they work together. So let's start in Ephesians 4.14. Ephesians 4, 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. This verse has always been a verse that has interested me over the years. And I believe it sums up some of the bad teaching, the bad doctrines that come through the church today. This is at a conclusion of a very powerful, jam-packed portion of Scripture, Ephesians 4. Years ago, Years ago, there was a commercial for a children's uh, cereal, and you know how do they pack all those grams into that gram? And they show pictures of kids, you know, <coughs> stomping on graham crackers, and each piece of that cereal is so packed full of graham crackers, and that stuff was the advertising of it, and. It, this is a picture of this portion of scripture and in the short time I'm doing this teaching um, I'm not going to be able to go into as many details but you can take the book of Ephesians and, and study it yourself. You can take this chapter and go, slew, th go through slow and dig into these verses. Well, we'll, we'll pick up here in verses 8, 9, 10. Um, a lot of different things, good, bad, I think are wrong, some things that are right, about this portion of Scripture. To me, part of my understanding in the Apostle Paul, who later on is talking about the armor of God, he sees a Roman soldier and the armor he has on, and begins to give an allegory. To me, this is a, a picture of when the Roman Empire in, in Egypt, they would go into nations and they would conquer them. And they would take the leader of that country and they would parade them when they returned to Rome and there'd be flowers and incense and music and a big parade would take place and they would parade their trophies. And that is part of what this portion of Scripture is when the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead in his resurrection and is a picture of a triumph what the Lord Jesus Christ did. And then he goes on into verse 11 where he talks about these offices. Uh, verse 12, the perfecting of the saints till we come to the unity of the faith. Verse 13, but he's building to a point and that point is in verse 14 about not being children, or there's one translation uses the word infants, that we're not babies. I remember as a kid growing up, we'd get mad at somebody, and we'd say, you babies, you babies stop crying, you babies stop complaining. Because there is a view there of babies um, not being real nice to be around. Um, this portion of scripture that we no more be children, infants, um, 
we have believers who, who grab hold of anything, much of what comes out there that is not very good. In Matthew 27, verses 50 through 54, there was a, a recording there of part of this, this triumph that the Lord Jesus Christ did over Satan and his demons. Uh, Psalm 68, 18 is a fulfillment of that. And 2 Corinthians 4, 7 talks about the treasures, which were what was taking place in Matthew 27, 50, um, 54. So <clears throat> we come to this point, and why does, in, in my view, in my take, with one wind of doctrine to another happen in the church. Why haven't we come to the full statue of a man? Why is because we have forsaken, or at least um, maybe belittle is not quite the word, but um, not realizing and not having these gifts. The scriptures there, this picture in Ephesians 4, you know, it gives the picture of how we come to a point where we're not infants in this warning that Paul gives. Well, we don't have much of these gifts in operation in the church today, even in the people who would say and label themselves uh, non-secessionists that these gifts are still for today, really don't practice that. And hence we have you know, books and movies and politicians and, and, you know, that has this wide range of spiritual junk food that's probably not going to kill you, but, you know, you can eat, there's a healthier way to eat, to false heresy and doctrine, they'll damn your soul. So we have this wide range of stuff. I've been a believer for over four decades and the last 15 years, I've never seen so many winds of bizarre doctrines that have come in. And not even the doctrines that would go to the intellectual realm, but the so-called revivals and some of the bizarre things they do in these, quote, revivals. Okay, so what do we, six things we notice in this verse. Don't be babies, and um, don't be tossed every way. Don't be driven by the wind and gust of teachings. Um, very recently, in the city where the world headquarters of the mass preacher is, there was an individual who I'd heard about. I really didn't know very much about him. And I hadn't really heard good or bad, I just knew he was very well known and famous. And he was speaking at a church that was very liberal politically, liberal theologically. Um, and it was interesting that he was going to this place to speak. Now, I visit a wide range of ch churches and community dinners and different things I've been involved in. but. There's none of them that would invite me to come and preach a, uh, a, a sermon, you know, full of the Holy Ghost and, you know, trying to get a spiritual revival started and preaching with my foundation in the Word of God. There's not a single one that would invite me in that context. You know, if I come for a community dinner or some other event or something, you know, they there's a face recognition, you know, they kind of recognize me, and they're glad to have me. But to come in as a man of God, preaching the Word, uh-uh, they won't touch that thing with a 20-foot pole. So it's fascinating that this one church was inviting this individual to come. And he was a very powerful speaker, one of the most powerful speakers I've ever heard in my life. And I could feel the demons coming off him. And he was turning the gospel into um, more of a, a social thing. And 
He was so powerful, he would present positions and he would joke about how, you know, he had made people back down and he had caused confusion among people, presenting certain positions that were unbalanced because he's a powerful speaker and you could say he had a reverse anointing. And this man was definitely going places with a wind of doctrine by the slight of men and fulfilling this verse. I mean, this verse was going through my head as I was listening to this man. Number four that we see in this little verse, a big verse, by cunning and craft used in deception. Number five, skillful, clever, crafty. And number six, hidden or hiding to deceive you. Jude 4 talks about that. Now let's go to the next verse. Remember at the end, I'm going to try to put this all together. 2 Timothy 4, 3. Let's read 2 Timothy 4, 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I'm going to read the next verse too. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned onto fables. This word here translated itching. Commentary says about it to scratch, um, by implication to tickle. Um, a com another commentary in this to this word heap here in this verse means to accumulate in piles. It speaks of a crowd electing teachers en masse. And a person to itch, uh, a person who desires to hear for mere gratification. There, I've heard this story, what I'm going to say. I know an individual and in her younger days she was walking down the street and car pulled up and said hey you know you're really something and I can make you a model and this individual you know told him to get lost and jump in a lake and you know you're nuts but there's these people on the take and scams who are looking for people who's looking to have their ears itch. And what in this little story that I told you is a perfect picture of people within the church willing to be a part of something to have an itch or desire scratched. You know, I have to say something, and um, I'm not a mean person, but... Uh, a lot of what goes on with the name of Christianity on TV is just an embarrassment. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. I'm just embarrassed by it. And if I was a, a false religion in another country, I would allow them to broadcast all day long because I would tell my people, you see what whack jobs this Christian religion is? They would do more advertising for me than me trying to, you know, criticize the religion. And I bring this up because how do these guys get away with it? Because these people are being told something and they're itching and they're supporting this guy, these guys, ladies, and it's really sad state of affairs. I have only heard in my, that I can remember, and I could be wrong, maybe I've forgotten, in my over 40 years of serving the Lord Jesus Christ, being, quote, in this thing called the church, three ministries, mine one of those three, only two other ministries that have ever stepped out and try to address some of these abuses that have gone on. I'm not saying there isn't more, but I'm saying that 
it sometimes we get caught up in our own little world and we don't see what's going on in this other thing this thing called the body of Christ okay let's go to 2 Chronicles 7 14 okay 2 Chronicles 7 14 if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will hear, heal their land. I found nine <clears throat> parts of this verse. God, if my people, my people, God's people. Number two, called by God's name. Number three, will humble themselves. Number four, pray. Number five, seek God. Number six, to turn from their sin. Number seven, God promises to hear. Number eight, God promises to forgive people's sin. Number nine, God will heal their nation. The word humble here in our English Bible, Hebrew um, word kana, um, the phrase in the Hebrew Old Testament here, uh, shall be humbled. The English translation of, of, of the, that form of that word. To bend the knee, hence to humiliate, to vanquish, to bring down low into subjection, to subdue. And so the picture here that the writer is giving us of what God wants from our heart towards him. We read earlier 1 2 Timothy 4.4 4, and um, there is an old translation from 1539 of 2 Timothy 4.4 4, and shall withdraw their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. This word fables, Greek word Moothus, a uh, myth, a fiction, a tale. A distinction here. When Jesus told the parable about the sower and the seed, he was not trying to tell a story about a real person. But he was using this allegory, if you will, this parable, to illustrate a real truth. A real idea, Matthew 3.13. Now, the definition of an allegory is, comes from the Greek word allegoria, from the description of one thing under the image of another. There is a cooking show that I, I love, and um, he was talking about collard greens and he was talking about when you cook them because I come from kind of a health food nut you know eating raw vegetables but with collard greens you really need to cook not overcook them to a certain point to release some of the nutrition and he goes through in a technical way and explains that I've also been a doctor of Chinese medicine that it, we had, I had talked to before concerning carrots and that same theory. Well, this is what parables and allegories do. Is It's like cooking this truth to release this revelation that's in it. Now, people who 2 Timothy is talking about here in, in Ephesians 4.14 um, these are people giving stuff, telling stories, telling fables, telling lies that have no truth. They're empty calories, spiritual junk food, or toxic things that will kill you. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Now let me see if I can put this whole thing 
together here. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be tr transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The Greek word here that's translated transform, met am o fo o osi, or this is where we get the word metamorphosis. There's a picture here of this transformation. We receive Christ, we're born again. And there's other scriptures in 1 Corinthians 15 that talk about the new body we're going to receive in heaven. But there's this transformation. We're justified, but we're not sanctified. And there's different arguments on the whole sanctification, justification thing. But to me here, these verses are like a caterpillar. And as we grow in Christ, I had some situations at my work um, last October, October 2014, and I mean, I was feeling pretty good about myself. I thought I had it all together, and these situations arose, and I had to punt the ball. I mean, I just had to, you know, step off the gas pedal and just, okay, Lord, put it in your hands, and not try to, um, you know, be the big boss and in real things, and things have really worked out good. But, it was this transformation and it's happening out until the time that I go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, so <clears throat> what God is doing in our lives in these things, we have a verse that's like a tornado that comes through, Ephesians 4.14, it comes through a neighborhood wrecking the place. I have seen doctrines come into the church and just destroy churches. And there may have been good parts to uh, a movement, so-called revival movement, some aspect of revival, a book, a politician, a person, but it goes crazy. It goes, just goes nuts and destroys churches. And these movements and books, they come into a church and just destroy it. And then 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4 talk about, you know, people wanting things that are not good for them. But 2 Chronicles 7, 14, that there's a repentance process that we need to go through and put God first in our life. And then this is what this transformation is for us to have victory in every area of our lives. So, I hope these verses are helpful to you. And every person listening to this is personally responsible at the Bema Seat for these verses, for the itching ears, that we don't have itching ears. As we are doing Romans 12 and 2, that we're in prayer, we're full of the Holy Ghost, we're applying the blood of Jesus over our sin. We're digging deep into the Word and building a solid foundation. And there are times we're going to have to leave. Movements, churches, it's going to take real wisdom and grace, but sometimes we're just going to have to say, you know, I have to um, wash my hands of what's going on here. Lord Jesus, I just pray for everyone here that's hearing this teaching, that God, you would speak to their hearts, Lord, about this day. There's some great things about the day, and the fact that somebody like me can put, can put something on YouTube, and you know, I can begin to teach in this thing called Christianity. So there's great things, but there's great trials, Lord, and we need to understand who you are, and understand your word more than we ever have, and not to be led astray, not to be driven by a so-called revival, not to be driven by some of these forces that are coming in to do their own changing. And Lord, I pray that everyone who hears this, Lord, would have a 
just a desire for your word, unlike like anything they've ever had in their life, that they would really build their house upon the rock of your word. And when the storms of life come, and when these doctrinal things blow into the church, they will stand, and even if it's alone. And Lord, for people who are a part of movements that I have maybe left, because of some of these things. I pray that you would encourage them. I pray that you'd give them a revelation about what they should do, where they are at. And I pray that you would put in your heart a need to study the book of Ephesians and just and really devour the scriptures. In Jesus' name. Signing off from somewhere partially underground, the mass preacher bids you good night.